The history of paleontology traces the history of the effort to understand the history of life on Earth by studying the fossil record left behind by living organisms. Since it is concerned with understanding living organisms of the past, paleontology can be considered to be a field of biology, but its historical development has been closely tied to geology and the effort to understand the history of the Earth itself. In ancient times Xenophanes, Herodotus, Eratosthenes, and Strabo wrote about fossils of marine organisms indicating that land was once underwater. During the Middle Ages, fossils were discussed by the Persian naturalist Ibn Sina in the Book of Healing, which proposed a theory of petrifying fluids that Albert of Saxony would elaborate on in the 14th century. The Chinese naturalist Shen Kuo would propose a theory of climate change based on evidence from petrified bamboo. In early modern Europe, the systematic study of fossils emerged as an integral part of the changes in natural philosophy that occurred during the Age of Reason. The nature of fossils and their relationship to life in the past became better understood during the 17th and 18th centuries. And at the end of the 18th century the work of Georges Cuvier ended a long-running debate about the reality of extinction and led to the emergence of paleontology, in association with comparative anatomy, as a scientific discipline. The expanding knowledge of the fossil record also played an increasing role in the development of geology, particularly stratigraphy. In 1822 the word paleontology was invented by the editor of a French scientific journal to refer to the study of ancient living organisms through fossils. And the first half of the 19th century saw geological and paleontological activity become increasingly well organized with the growth of geologic societies and museums and an increasing number of professional geologists and fossil specialists. This contributed to a rapid increase in knowledge about the history of life on Earth and progress towards definition of the geologic time scale largely based on fossil evidence. As knowledge of life's history continued to improve, it became increasingly obvious that there had been some kind of successive order to the development of life. This would encourage early evolutionary theories on the transmutation of species. After Charles Darwin published Origin of Species in 1859, much of the focus of paleontology shifted to understanding evolutionary paths, including human evolution and evolutionary theory. The last half of the 19th century saw a tremendous expansion in paleontological activity, especially in North America. The trend continued in the 20th century, with additional regions of the Earth being open to systematic fossil collection, as demonstrated by a series of important discoveries in China near the end of the 20th century. Many transitional fossils have been discovered, and there is now considered to be abundant evidence of how all classes of vertebrates are related, much of it in the form of transitional fossils. The last few decades of the 20th century saw a renewed interest in mass extinctions and their role in the evolution of life on Earth. There was also a renewed interest in the Cambrian explosion that saw the development of the body plans of most animal phyla. The discovery of fossils of the Ediacaran biota and developments in paleobiology extended knowledge about the history of life back far before the Cambrian, prior to the 17th century. As early as the 6th century BC, the Greek philosopher Xenophanes of Colophon recognized that some fossil shells were remains of shellfish, which he used to argue that what was at the time dry land was once under the sea. Leonardo da Vinci, in an unpublished notebook, also concluded that some fossil sea shells were the remains of shellfish. However, in both cases, the fossils were complete remains of shellfish species that closely resembled living species and were therefore easy to classify. In 1027, the Persian naturalist Ibn Sina proposed an explanation of how the stoniness of fossils was caused in the Book of Healing. He modified an idea of Aristotle's, which explained it in terms of aporous exhalations. Ibn Sina modified this into the theory of petrifying fluids. 
which was elaborated on by Albert of Saxony in the 14th century and was accepted in some form by most naturalists by the 16th century. Shen Kuo of the Song dynasty used marine fossils found in the Taihang Mountains to infer the existence of geological processes such as geomorphology and the shifting of seashores over time. Using his observation of preserved petrified bamboos found underground in Yunnan, Shabei region, Shaanxi province, he argued for a theory of gradual climate change. Since Shaanxi was a part of a dry climate zone that did not support a habitat for the growth of bamboos, as a result of a new emphasis on observing, classifying, and cataloging nature, 16th century natural philosophers in Europe began to establish extensive collections of fossil objects, which were often stored in specially built cabinets to help organize them. Conrad Gesner published a 1565 work on fossils that contained one of the first detailed descriptions of such a carbonate and collection. The collection belonged to a member of the extensive network of correspondence that Gesner drew on for his works. Such informal correspondence networks among natural philosophers and collectors became increasingly important during the course of the 16th century, and were direct forerunners of the scientific societies that would begin to form in the 17th century. These cabinet collections and correspondence networks played an important role in the development of natural philosophy. However, most 16th-century Europeans did not recognize that fossils were the remains of living organisms. The etymology of the word fossil comes from the Latin for things having been dug up. As this indicates, the term was applied to wide variety of stone and stone-like objects without regard to whether they might have an organic origin. 16th-century writers such as Gesner and Georg Agricola were more interested in classifying such objects by their physical and mystical properties than they were in determining the object's origins. In addition, the natural philosophy of the period encouraged alternative explanations for the origin of fossils. Both the Aristotelian and Neoplatonic schools of philosophy provided support for the idea that stony objects might grow within the earth to resemble living things. Neoplatonic philosophy maintained that there could be affinities between living and non-living objects that could cause one to resemble the other. The Aristotelian school maintained that the seeds of living organisms could enter the ground and generate objects resembling those organisms. 17th century during the Age of Reason, fundamental changes in natural philosophy were reflected in the analysis of fossils. In 1665 Athanasius Kicker attributed giant bones to extinct races of giant humans in his Mundus Subterraneus. In the same year Robert Hooke published Micrographia, an illustrated collection of his observations with a microscope. One of these observations was entitled, Of Petrified Wood, and Other Petrified Bodies, which included a comparison between petrified and ordinary wood. He concluded that petrified wood was ordinary wood that had been soaked with water impregnated with stony and earthy particles. He then suggested that several kinds of fossil seashells were formed from ordinary shells by a similar process. He argued against the prevalent view that such objects were stones formed by some extraordinary plastic virtue latent in the earth itself. Hook believed that fossils provided evidence about the history of life on Earth writing in 1668. If the finding of coinless, medals, urns, and other monuments of famous persons, or towns, or utensils, be admitted for unquestionable proofs that such persons or things have, in former times had a being, Certainly those petrifactions may be allowed to be of equal validity and evidence that there have formerly been such vegetables or animals, and a true universal characters legible to all rational men. Hook was prepared to accept the possibility that some such fossils represented species that had become extinct, possibly in past geological catastrophes. In 1667 Nicholas Steno wrote a paper about his shark head he had dissected. He compared the teeth of the shark with the common fossil objects known as tungstones. He concluded that the fossils must have been shark teeth. 
Steno then took an interest in the question of fossils, and to address some of the objections to their organic origin he began studying rock strata. The result of this work was published in 1669 as forerunner to a dissertation on a solid naturally enclosed in a solid. In this book, Steno drew a clear distinction between objects such as rock crystals that really were formed within rocks and those such as fossil shells and shark teeth that were formed outside of those rocks. Steno realized that certain kinds of rock had been formed by the successive deposition of horizontal layers of sediment and that fossils were the remains of living organisms that had become buried in that sediment. Steno who, like almost all 17th century natural philosophers believed that the earth was only a few thousand years old, resorted to the biblical flood as a possible explanation for fossils of marine organisms that were far from the sea. Despite the considerable influence of forerunner, naturalists such as Martin Lister and John Ray continued to question the organic origin of some fossils. They were particularly concerned about objects such as fossil ammonites, which Hook claimed were organic in origin, that did not resemble any known living species. This raised the possibility of extinction, which they found difficult to accept for philosophical and theological reasons. In 1695 Ray wrote to the Welsh naturalist Edward Lloyd complaining of such views. There follows such a train of consequences, as seem to shock the scripture history of the novelty of the world, at least they overthrow the opinion received, and not without good reason, among divines and philosophers, that since the first creation there have been no species of animals or vegetables lost, no new ones produced, 18th century. In his 1778 work Epochs of Nature Georges Buffon referred to fossils, in particular the discovery of fossils of tropical species such as elephants and rhinoceros in northern Europe, as evidence for the theory that the Earth had started out much warmer than it currently was and had been gradually cooling. In 1796 Georges Cuvier presented a paper on living than fossil elephants comparing skeletal remains of Indian and African elephants to fossils of mammoths and of an animal he would later name Mastodon utilizing comparative anatomy. He further concluded that the Mastodon was another extinct species that also differed from Indian or African elephants, more so than mammoths. Cuvier made another powerful demonstration of the power of comparative anatomy in paleontology when he presented a second paper in 1796 on a large fossil skeleton from Paraguay, which he named Megatherium and identified as a giant sloth by comparing its skull to those of two living species of tree sloth. Cuvier's groundbreaking work in paleontology and comparative anatomy led to the widespread acceptance of extinction. It also led Cuvier to advocate the geological theory of catastrophism to explain the succession of organisms revealed by the fossil record. He also pointed out that since mammoths and woolly rhinoceros were not the same species as the elephants and rhinoceros currently living in the tropics, their fossils could not be used as evidence for a cooling earth. In a pioneering application of stratigraphy, William Smith, a surveyor and mining engineer, made extensive use of fossils to help correlate rock strata in different locations. He created the first geological map of England during the late 1790s and early 19th century. He established the principle of faunal succession, the idea that each strata of sedimentary rock would contain particular types of fossils, and that these would succeed one another in a predictable way even in widely separated geologic formations. At the same time, Cuvier and Alexandre Brongniot, an instructor at the Paris School of Mine Engineering, used similar methods in an influential study of the geology of the region around Paris.